Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, we've got an ideal weather for the conference. I haven't seen this room so much crowded yet. And uh, thanks to Neven, you ordered it very well. Uh, I do appreciate everybody who came. And uh, it's my honor and great pleasure to introduce the plenary speaker. Professor Robin Smith uh, has been one of the key persons uh, at Center for Process Integration and the director for many years at UMIST and later uh, the University of Manchester. He has uh, authored numerous papers, but some of them are the most highly cited papers uh, in the UK and ever. He is also fellow of Royal Academy, which is uh, the UK equivalent of Academy of Sciences. He is the fellow of ICME. And uh, recently he was awarded by Roger Sargent Award. Roger Sargent was uh, the founder of Process System Engineering, the professor at Imperial College. And uh, in his memory, every year the top persons around the world are awarded by this medal. So, uh, Robin, the floor is yours, and uh, you've got uh, enough time to tell us what are the new developments. Okay, thank you. Everybody hear me okay? I think so. Um, thank you all for coming. Yeah, as Yuri says, no doubt nothing to do with the thunderstorm outside. It's all to do with your interest in rethinking future industrial energy systems. Um, I'm going to take a broader perspective as well, not just look at industrial systems, but um, try to look forward to how this has an impact on society. But let's start by looking at industrial energy consumption and emissions. Now, unfortunately, I can only point at one screen. You've got the luxury of being able to look at two, but I can only point at one. So I'm going to point at this one. I, I hope that's OK with everybody. Well, let's, let's look at the industrial sector. Um, if we break down the uh, uh, emissions from the whole of um, society, then it breaks down, uh, as we see here, uh, can't see it too clearly, but the biggest uh, bar there is one for electricity and heat generation. But when we take that and we put it inside of the industry, which it is being the places where it is actually being used in industry, then um, it turns out that um, the industrial sector turns out to be the largest emitter of CO2 emissions uh, and uh, individually it accounts for some 36% of the global greenhouse gas emissions. Two thirds of that comes from a small number of uh, industries and you can easily guess it's industries like steel, uh, uh, cement, uh, chemicals, petrochemicals, in the UK, we have made a commitment to decarbonize and we have committed to create the first zero, net zero carbon industrial cluster by 2040 and at least one uh, low carbon cluster by 2030. So that gives us a picture that the Industrial emissions are key if we're going to solve this problem of having a sustainable future. So industry is the largest consumer of energy worldwide. You see here the, the breakdown uh, and uh, some 32% coming from industry. What's interesting also is that you see that a large part of this, most of it, is actually down to process heating. Some of it is electricity generation, that's significant, but the process heating is uh, a major element there. So 
69% of industrial emissions are from the process industries of that uh, industrial sector. And that accounts for about two thirds of industrial emissions. So if we just pursue this issue of um, how that energy is used, it's shown here as a breakdown uh, in terms of process heating. So we're taking this uh, part of the uh, energy consumption here, 60%, and, and showing it here as it's broken down in terms of its, uh, the temperatures at which it occurs. And although you can't read that, uh, I can tell you that uh, what it's actually telling us is that around 50% is relatively low temperature heating. Of course, if you go to steel making, it's a very high temperature, but most of this uh, uh, heating goes on below 500 degrees C. And that's um, key to us. Most of that would be supplied uh, via steam. But we have different media coming into play. We've got fired heat, furnaces, we've got steam, we've got hot water all coming into play. Now, if we look at the, uh, the, the, the trend with energy consumption, then we see here that um, there's a steady growth in uh, demand for energy in industry through time. And around uh, 2014 here, we saw uh, a decrease in the rate of increase. I'll choose my words carefully here. Um, that we're not seeing any decrease in consumption. We, the, the rate of increase is coming down a little bit. Uh, well, it's coming down significantly. Um, slowed down to a third, that, that uh, rate of increase. Uh, and that's good news. It's remarkable. But if we just project going forward, um, what the implications of that are, we just trend that away into the future. That means we're going to use 30% more energy before 2040. Now, what does that mean in practical terms? It means adding another China and another India onto the uh, consumption of energy. And that doesn't appear to be too sustainable. So, alone, uh, energy conservation is not going to solve the problem. We've got to reduce our demand for fossil fuels and their associated uh, environmental impact. So, challenges here are we want to switch to renewables. We also want to carry on with energy efficiency. Both of them have a key role to play. Um, and what we're looking for in the long term is a 90% reduction in the CO2 emissions by 2050, and that's so that we can fulfill the uh, Paris Agreement and keep our global temperature rise below 2 degrees C. That's the goal, and that trend is then uh, to move us to a more sustainable use of energy. Let's look then, if um, renewable energy is going to be a key player, let's look at the growth and how that's going. Um, if we start uh, at the, the current level, we start here with a baseline of 2015 uh, and look at how renewable energy is growing. It starts at 2015 with some 19% um, of uh, global energy demand coming from renewables. In power generation, that means 23%. But in the industrial sector, only 9%. So the industrial sector is lagging behind in terms of uh, its uh, adoption of renewable sources. Uh, and then we project that through to 2030. That takes us to somewhere in the region of 21 to 37 percent of the global energy demand being satisfied by um, uh, renewables, which in industry would be projected to be 13 to 23 percent. Now, those are, are rather large bands. The lower bound here is simply by carrying on with current policies. If we carry on the way we are doing, then we're going to achieve 21% and 13%. If we accelerate the implementation of renewables, then we can bring forward much better uh, prospects, 37% and 23%. So it depends very much on policies uh, as to how successful we will be. So project it forward then to uh, 2050, 
and we see uh, some 23 to 61% of global demand being satisfied by renewables. Uh, in power generation, higher, as we would expect, 37 to 82%, and in industry, lagging behind 16 to 39%. So the industrial sector certainly is lagging behind. Um, and uh, the good news is we're looking uh, to something like three times the amount of renewable energy being used. So that would give us effective decarbonisation, but it also brings problems with it. Um, it causes uh, fluctuations in supply, uh, wind and solar. We don't have to uh, explain why we get those uh, variations. And to compensate for that, we need uh, additional uh, electric generation capacity. So let's follow that through now and look at the implications in a bit more detail on future industrial energy systems. We've got to start by core generation. Combined heat and power generation, uh, we use uh, the energy both to generate electricity and the energy that we're not using is used to generate heat rather than the standalone arrangement where we have standalone power generation and we fire uh, fuel to provide the heat that we need separately. There's no new concept there. The Victorian engineers were very good at implementing this. Uh, it was well known to the Victorian engineers, but we still somehow keep on learning this lesson that combined heat and power generation is the most efficient way to generate uh, electricity and heat. And uh, if we use CHP, some 40% better in terms of the uh, efficiency. But what we need to do then is to look forward and um, see how we might exploit that further. And let's start by where we are now at the moment. What we would tend to do is um, we have uh, electricity which is here being distributed from a substation. Uh, the electricity is coming from uh, centralised power generation via a centralised grid, but we'll expect to see certainly more solar and wind contribution to that supply, which would then go off to the residential uh, consumers, uh, to the uh, commercial, industrial consumers here. Uh, and we're likely to see also um, conventional combined heat and power here. Not too much of it, but certainly some there, uh, supplying uh, heat and electricity locally to commerce and industry. And what we need to do is to uh, make this uh, whole concept more flexible and bring in industry into this picture. So here we've got um, industry, the heavy industry, playing its part in society, but being supplied here by um, a another CHP system, combined heat and power system, which is linked up to residents, perhaps providing hot water by district heating, electricity going into the uh, substation here, uh, electricity maybe going directly into industry, uh, waste heat from uh, the uh, industrial uh, usage here uh, being used usefully in this uh, flexible CHP plant, probably being upgraded to, to make it something useful. So what we're looking then towards is a more distributed nature of um, power generation. Uh, distributed, uh, we obviously need to interact with the grid. Um, we can uh, provide both uh, thermal energy and electricity with this arrangement. Uh, and uh, we can also produce electricity uh, for the grid. So the, these flexible CHP systems can provide grid services and I'm sure are going to be important in the future, but there's very little attention being paid to them so far. Very difficult to find examples even of this kind of uh, centralised uh, combined heat and power arrangement. Let's look in particular now at 
uh, and a bit more detail of an industrial system. And we're supplying heat here in an industrial system. So a few words of explanation for those who are not familiar with steam systems. We use steam for most of the heating in our uh, low temperature applications in industry. And how do we generate the steam? Well, we uh, fire fuel in a boiler, generate steam. Here it goes into a steam header, which is distributed to the various users. This is high pressure steam. And then this is going to be at a high temperature. And then we let the pressure down to lower pressures of steam, medium pressure and low pressure steam. We let it down through um, steam turbines. And this is a good example of uh, industry using combined heat and power. Uh, we generate the power and we take the heat and use it for process heating. So we see here process heating at the high pressure, medium uh, and low pressure levels. We also got, just to complete the picture, some letdown stations and these are controlled arrangements to control the pressures of the steam headers. Um, but we are traditionally feeding into this steam system by firing fuel in a boiler, generates steam, goes in here. Now that's a typical arrangement. If we go to what's likely to happen in the future, we're likely to see more renewables coming in. Now, renewable energy is going to come mostly in the form of electricity. Uh, so whether it be hydro, whether it be solar, whether it be wind, uh, we're going to get our form uh, of energy and electricity, or much more of it is electricity, uh, in which case, uh, rather than having a fuel-fired boiler here, we're going to have electric boilers. So, uh, like a, just like a big immersion heater generating steam. Uh, and uh, this has important implications because if we were just to take in electricity rather than firing fuel, then we would use our electric boiler to generate steam. But there would be no point in having steam turbines because there would be no point in turning electricity into steam and then turning steam back into electricity. So the system will have to change completely uh, if we adopt this kind of uh, renewable energy source. Um, but, of course, life is never quite that straightforward uh, because we have other sources of energy which are likely to come in as well. Uh, for example, biomass. Um, we, uh, we can uh, bring in uh, uh, biomass as a source of energy, whether it's uh, crops, um, agricultural waste, whatever it happens to be, um, and it comes in uh, as uh, some form of energy here, which is likely then to be fired. And we're going to have in industry a lot of waste gases. Certainly in the chemical industry, you can't get away from the fact that we produce waste gases. The waste gases can't just be discharged to the atmosphere, so you burn them, you may as well burn them to produce electricity, uh, uh, produce heat and uh, uh, electricity. So uh, we've also got the possibility of introducing uh, waste to energy in this. So take uh, domestic, commercial waste and transform that into energy. And so we've got a mix of different sources. We're likely to see more electric boilers but we probably can't get away with removing all of these uh, fuel-fired boilers even if we are uh, only firing in them uh, biomass uh, and, and waste gases. So we've got the possibility of a completely different system, configuration and operation. And what we want to know is what's the most appropriate mix of sources and technologies. Another feature, particularly as we introduce more renewables, is um, that we have problems with um, security of supply, variation in supply, and we need to think in terms of um, integration of storage, electricity and thermal storage. So uh, electrical storage, um, I think probably the, the three uh, prime ones I would think of were pumped hydro, but pumped hydro, you need to be in a place where you can pump water up to a hill in large quantities and leave it there until you need it and run it down the hill. Uh, liquid air storage systems where we, uh, when electricity is cheap, we 
liquefy air, we store it as a liquid, and then when we need power, we allow the liquid air to vaporize and expand through a turbine to generate power. There is um, quite a large pilot scale facility in the UK um, demonstrating this as a, as, a, as a viable option. Most of the talk, though, is about batteries. Um, so, uh, a lot of talk about batteries, particularly grid storage um, of electricity. But we also have the possibility of um, storing heat. We can do it in our industrial steam systems using steam accumulators. Again, this is nothing new. The Victorian engineers were very good at using steam accumulators. Uh, we can also store as hot water, even though this is uh, a less uh, efficient way to store heat. So we want to know what type, what size, uh, and we want to know then how we are going to transition uh, this whole thing from where we are to where we want to be in the long term. Integrating the uh, renewables, the different forms, different size, uh, sources of energy, uh, along with uh, grid electricity, we've got storage, and how do we link everything up uh, and make sure that everything is supplied securely. We need to know the configuration, we need to know another important point is whether we are going to centralize or distribute the power generation uh, and maybe use a combination of the two. So, where does it get to? It gets to our goal here. Uh, our goal uh, here is to um, develop a system, a design and optimization framework that takes in the needs of the uh, industry, so heating and cooling profiles, the power requirements, and that design and optimization framework which we want to develop will design uh, the utility system, the energy system, whether it be distributed or centralized, and also uh, tell us how to operate this system, the operating strategy. Uh, into this, um, as options, we will have uh, fossil and renewable energy sources, a full range of energy conservation technologies, storage of steam and hot water, and also power storage. Uh, and then uh, we have constraints that we're going to have to live with, uh, constraints on the utility options. We're going to have time dependency coming in here as well because we can't generate solar power at night. Uh, we've got uh, life cycle costs which need to come in, and we also want to put in sustainability constraints. And if we can develop this framework, then what we can do is we can use it to develop roadmaps to evolve from where we are to when, where we want to be in the long term. We're not going to get there in a single step. So we have to evolve over a period of time uh, and develop roadmaps to see where we want to be in the long term. So, how do we do this in a bit more detail? Uh, how do we do the conceptual design of future industrial energy systems? Well, a little bit of detail. Um, I can't go into too much detail. I know there's a mixed audience here, but I'll try and give you a flavor for uh, how uh, we're going to do that. Well, we start with, on a site or in an industrial cluster, we have processes that have energy demands. And we look at it in terms of temperature on this scale and energy enthalpy on this scale, heat on this scale. Uh, and we've got different processes. What we do is we combine them together in that cluster into two profiles. This profile here on the left shows that we need to reject heat, so we've got waste heat. We want to do something useful with it. Uh, here we've got our heating demand. So heat's coming in here somehow to satisfy all of these requirements. This is a combined curve from these curves up here, and this is a combined cooling requirement from these uh, individual cooling requirements up there. So how do we do it? Well. In this intermediate temperature range here, we can use steam. We can cool with steam by generating steam, or we can use steam to provide heating. Um, so steam serves two purposes here. Uh, and uh, we want to know the number of steam mains, the operating conditions of those steam mains, 
uh, for the production of the steam. We want to know the type of equipment, the fuel that we're firing, the size, the load. Uh, at the higher temperature end here, too high to provide with steam, then we're going to have to provide some fired heating, a furnace. Down here at the bottom end, we've got cooling, too cool to involve with the steam system. So are we going to use cooling water? Are we going to try and recover it with an organic ranking cycle? Or are we just going to capture it as hot water and use it usefully somewhere else? So what are the degrees of freedom? Here is a, um, a steam system like the one I explained before. Boilers, a gas turbine here with a heat recovery steam generator. Here's steam generators producing steam from waste heat from the processes, steam turbines letting down between the steam mains, um, deaerators producing the boiler feed water. Uh, and for the boilers, we want to know what type. Are we going to use electric boilers, biomass, waste heat boilers? What type of fuel, biofuels, natural gas, waste gases? Uh, what temperature and pressure we're going to have, what size and load we're going to have. And, uh, and then we have another complication. Another complication is that this is not going to operate at steady conditions. It's going to vary in its operating conditions and the performance of this equipment in terms of its efficiency will vary according to its load. So its efficiency will vary and we need to take that into account. So the models need to capture the effect of load on efficiency. Um, so here then we've got uh, the steam turbines, similar kind of story. We need to know the type, the size, the inlet and outlet conditions, uh, and the efficiency of that turbine will vary according to the load that we put on it. Gas turbines, similar story. Um, we uh, want to know what type and size and so on, what fuel we're going to use, but the efficiency also varies with load. So um, we also want to build in flexibility uh, in terms of the number and sizes of the units. Now here is an additional complication which has often been neglected uh, in the design of these systems. They never at steady state conditions but they always must operate. Uh, otherwise it creates major problems and even safety problems in the, uh, uh, in the processes, in the manufacturing processes. So we either use large units at part load operating most of the time, which we term active redundancy, spare capacity, or we use small units at full load, uh, one switched off, which we term passive redundancy, and we've got to make basic decisions here. This utility system, this energy system, must always operate, uh, even though it's got a varying demand on it, it's got a varying supply to it, it still must always operate. So we can use bigger size units, which might be more efficient, but when they go to partial load, they become less efficient. Fewer units might be less expensive, but uh, with fewer units, it becomes less reliable. So we have some basic decisions to make. Here's a steam system, uh, and maybe we want to put in some redundancy here, uh, some uh, spare equipment, uh, an extra boiler just for contingency, uh, and an extra steam turbine there. And these are basic decisions that we need to make. And so, for those types of units, more units of the same type or more units of different types but performing the same functions, also a possibility. So here, uh, rather than having a steam turbine, we have here a gas turbine with a heat recovery steam generator. So multiple design and operational degrees of freedom uh, and these variables are highly interrelated. So it's a complex optimization problem. So uh, we, for the steam mains, we need to know whether we've got the right number and size. Uh, here's the range over which the steam mains are going to operate, and maybe we decide we're going to have two steam mains like this uh, operating somewhere in these ranges, and we don't quite know where yet, but we're going to decide that later. Uh, and for the high temperature, we're going to use a hot oil to heat it. Uh, and maybe we're going to introduce a third steam main. So if we introduce a third steam main, like high pressure steam as we've done here, uh, this uh, may bring us uh, benefits. So we need to know the 
uh, steam mains pressures uh, and we need to know what kind of conditions under which they're operating. So here we see over here on the right uh, a site cooling profile where we're generating high pressure, medium pressure, low pressure steam and rejecting heat to cooling water and over here we're using high pressure, medium pressure and low pressure steam and there's a fundamental assumption there that the only heating from the steam uh, and the only cooling from the steam is all its saturated conditions. Now that's just to simplify the diagram for the moment, I'll come back to that point. So maybe we choose to use medium pressure steam at a different pressure, so we drop the pressure. Uh, and that might allow us to generate more power in the steam turbines, but if I'm going to drop the pressure here, I'm also going to have to drop the pressure over there on the using side, which means that uh, I'm going to have to use more high pressure steam uh, and less medium pressure steam, which means I'm going to lose power generation capacity. So it's not a simple trade-off this. Um, so um, another point that we need to bring in is that um, steam is generated in the first instance by taking boiler feed water, preheating it, evaporating it and then superheating it. And the synthesis methods which have been published to date use only the latent heat part of the steam. Uh, but we must include the boiler feed water preheating and the superheating. Uh, this is an essential feature. Just to give you an idea of the kind of errors which this brings in if you assume only the latent heat. High pressure steam the latent heat is about half of the total energy to take you from boiler feed water to uh, superheated steam conditions. So major errors if you don't include these effects and you might think, oh, well, this is a fairly trivial addition, it becomes very non-trivial when you start to do the calculations. Uh, and when we're doing uh, accounting for the uh, use of the steam here, the processes are using steam for their heating. They might want to do desuperheating of the steam because they don't want superheated steam and they might want to do flash steam recovery. Another complication is that we have non-isothermal mixing in these arrangements which creates mathematical problems for us. Um, and so how do we solve the problem? Well, we're going to get the structure that we want by creating a superstructure. I'm sure a lot of it you're familiar with the concept, but basically what you do is you create a structure that has all of the features that you might potentially want for an optimal answer. Uh, and you're not going to include them all in the final design, but what you're going to do is you're going to create this superstructure, you're then going to optimize that superstructure, and you're going to get the optimization to remove the structural features which are not economic. That's basically the approach that uh, you're going to use. So you're going to optimize a superstructure including all the structural op uh, options uh, to obtain an energy efficient structure and the optimum conditions, the operating conditions for the, st uh, the steam headers and all the rest of it. So the problem formulation um, for design uh, and determining the operating conditions um, we, uh, part of it is that we have a mixed integer program. We make our discrete decisions by introducing integer variables, zero, one variables, zero if it's not there, one if it is there. Uh, and then we've got other parts of the problem which are nonlinear mathematically. Uh, so we have a nonlinear program. Uh, this accounts for things like equipment performances, steam thermodynamic properties, and then when we put the two together, we have a non-convex mixed integer non-linear program. The people who um, enjoy this kind of um, uh, optimization work uh, rub their hands when they see, uh, uh, with glee, when they see uh, an MINLP problem. I'm afraid I go yuck uh, and uh, accept it and then move on. Uh, because it brings in all kinds of complexities in the solution. Uh, so it becomes a complex uh, and time-consuming solution. Another problem. Previously, designs were based on nominal, nominal average operating conditions for each process. But in reality, things vary through time. If we take a yearly uh, mean demand, that might 
lead to suboptimal solutions and inaccurate economic evaluation. If we account for the variable demand, the uh, design is going to be much more resilient, but it's also going to be a much more complex problem to solve. So, how do we solve this? Well, we introduce multiple periods. So we take, uh, we slice up time into periods, and within each period, we assume things are at steady state. So we've got lots of these different periods to account for the variation through time. Uh, and this might be uh, simply relating to uh, the season as we change through the year. And then within each of these periods, we might have um, inter-seasonal uh, uh, periods. So we might want to uh, take account of changes through the time of the day, the day of the week, and the time of the year, the season of the year. Uh, all of these we might want to do. And how do we deal with that? Well, we've got to create uh, a structure where it looks um, schematically like this, where we've got these different operating periods, and we've got this uh, design uh, which has got to function across these different operating periods, but it will function different ways uh, in terms of its economics and its environmental impact as it goes through those different periods. So we need to synthesize the utility system, accounting for those energy demand uh, variations. We also need to include energy storage. So um, yeah, for steam, we can put in steam accumulators, for example. Uh, this can give us short-term storage uh, of, uh, of heat uh, as part of the system over here, but it's relatively short period, hours or days at the most. We can bring in battery storage, different kinds of batteries, lithium ion, lead acid and so on. Uh, these have different efficiencies, different costs, and also short-term storage, but th this time possibly up to a week uh, in terms of the, the storage. And we've adopted two different approaches to the optimization. Um, we've tried different ways to solve the problem. Uh, same problem, but different solution strategies. We tried using, um, for those who understand these systems, a successive mixed integer linear program. It works okay, but doesn't give a guarantee of the global optimality. It gives you, s it gives you answers, but not necessarily the global optimum answer. It's relatively fast. It, it runs in something like 500 seconds or so. Um, but the approach that we've adopted in the end is a nonlinear approach where we use uh, a, uh, a relaxed uh, mixed integer nonlinear programming approach followed by a, a nonlinear subproblem. Um, this, it's, the, this, this has been used previously, so we're not. Um, uh, claiming any novelty in that. Um, we have researched it, compared it not just with the, uh, the kind of uh, successive mixed integer linear approach, we've also uh, compared it with the, the commercial solvers like Baron, if you're familiar with that, part of the GAM suite. Uh, and uh, we find it gives much more, the approach that we've developed, much more robust answers with a guaranteed optimality and relative to uh, the, the Baron software, it runs about 10 times faster. So we've got a method to solve our problem. Let's try it on a case study. So uh, here is a site. Um, it's a six plant uh, chemical cluster. Uh, we want to know the utility system to satisfy the thermal and electrical demand. Uh, we've got electrical uh, price fluctuations, which we'll see on the next slide. We've got semi-continuous processes, and we've got variation of the production profiles. We've also got maintenance and shutdown. So you see here the operating profiles. This one is fairly steady state. This one is up and down. This uh, one is up and down. Uh, so we've got the operating profiles here for this chemical cluster uh, varying through time. Uh, the constraints we're going to impose are utility temperature constraints, equipment load and size, and we're going to uh, restrict ourselves on the import and the export potential to 1 and 10 megawatts. Um, 
We've got electricity price fluctuations across the day. We've got off-peak, peak, and base price. We've got across the year, we've got winter, summer, uh, and mid-season. Um, uh, some of the numbers are up there for you, but um, uh, another point to, uh, uh, to note here are the uh, emissions factors for uh, CO2 emissions, for grid electricity, fuel gas, uh, natural gas. The, uh, we've got those emissions factors in there because we look at CO2 emissions later. Uh, the variation of the annual uh, energy demand, um, it's uh, been divided into 20 periods, uh, each with three tariffs giving us a total of 60 periods that we are going to analyse the problem for. We're going to also uh, analyse two scenarios uh, in order to analyse the effect of energy demand variation and that's uh, firstly to minimise the total annualised cost uh, and also then to uh, just minimise the carbon dioxide emissions. Firstly, if we optimise for total annualised cost, then we will see here the solution for the, the energy system for that um, cluster uh, if we assume simply the average conditions. So we're assuming average conditions here, nominal conditions, and that's the design that we get. Compare that then with the design that we get if we assume a variable demand. Uh, it looks superficially similar, and it is kind of similar, but what you see are different operating conditions and different design configurations uh, as a result of taking account of the variations. And this shows the uh, electrical operation to satisfy the electrical demand, so the thick line at the top is the electrical demand, uh, and how we are satisfying it. Uh, in some cases, you see here, we are importing and some times we are exporting electricity down here. So um, the uh, electricity uh, is here in this solution being satisfied by generating electricity from four steam turbines with some um, export and some import in some cases. The thermal demand here, um, we see the thermal demand, this line here, varying through the year, and we're supplying that uh, with um, uh, a combination of two boilers and a hot oil circuit down here. Um, we'll also note here why we are dipping down uh, and importing electricity here. We're importing electricity at this point here because we don't have a high thermal demand there and therefore we can't co-generate our electricity and that's what's leading us to um, import electricity uh, at that point there. So uh, another point to note is although we have included energy storage as an option it's not picked it out um, and uh, what uh, this is doing is it's designing a flexible utility system uh, and it's paying for and operating a flexible utility system um, rather than using storage. So what happens if we push the sensitivity of the economics here? And this is a, a sensitivity analysis which shows uh, what happens if we vary the difference between peak and off-peak electricity. And we, we've gone here from 40% where we are, all the way through to 230% difference. Um, and we've gone this far in order to demonstrate just how far you need to go before it becomes economic to bring in electricity storage. So it needs quite a big difference in the peak and off-peak electricity prices in order to make uh, electricity storage economic. Uh, and these are led uh, batteries and it requires 2.3 times higher um, uh, peak price in order to make them economic. If we were to use spot market uh, prices for the electricity we're likely to see a different story again. Um, you can analyse this problem uh, either using uh, well-defined tariffs or using the spot market. The spot market gives wilder variations and it's likely to see more storage under those conditions. 
But doing the calculation again with uh, minimizing CO2 emissions, we get a different picture. Here is the um, electricity, uh, and uh, there is the demand for electricity, as we see here. Uh, and uh, the picture uh, is different now. We still got a lot of generation of steam from steam turbines, but you will see also here um, batteries being used, they're being charged down here and discharged up here. So battery storage is starting to uh, kick in here uh, in order to reduce the CO2 emissions. Uh, thermal operation, um, pretty much as before, two boilers uh, and uh, a hot oil circuit. Uh, overall, um, a reduced thermal load as a result of the optimization. But um, further analysis would be required here to get this trade off between um, CO2 and total annual cost. So energy storage becomes economically attractive once we start to bring in um, uh, decarbonization objectives. This looks at the um, effect of the economics and uh, the one uh, maybe shown here in red is important as that we minimize uh, for CO2 emissions. Surely, yes, it does bring down the CO2 emissions significantly, but it also pushes up the cost significantly. So, um, summarizing this study then, utility system design based on nominal uh, uh, consumptions can lead to lower capital cost, but lead to a lower efficiency and gr lower and higher greenhouse gas emissions. Based on current energy prices, um, uh, it's uh, cheaper to use the utility system components rather than to incorporate energy storage. So cheaper to incorporate flexibility into the design rather than to use energy storage. I'm a, I'm a bit surprised by that, maybe you are, but I'm a little bit surprised, but that's how it, it is. It is what it is. Uh, at significant fluctuations in electricity price, then storage uh, can have the potential to reduce the total annual costs, but it really does re require a significant difference between peak and off-peak electricity for that to happen. Um, and storage has the potential to reduce CO2 emissions. Um, however, there's a significant trade-off here between cost and uh, the um, performance. I'd like to just finish off now by putting this within the context of energy and society. Um, industry at the moment pretty much operates on its own, separate from society in terms of energy. But in the future, we need to bring all of this together, energy and society. So here is society, including industry, um, transportation, uh, commerce, um, domestic energy, aviation, all the rest of it. Uh, what do we need overall? We need electricity, we need heat, and we need transportation energy uh, in order to satisfy the uh, requirements of society. And these have traditionally not been integrated. Um, another problem that we need to understand is that energy is competing for resource with the supply of water and food. Uh, and traditionally, we haven't looked at this problem either. So uh, this needs, uh, the provision of energy needs to be considered within the context of this so-called energy food water nexus. So uh, uh, what is the nexus? Well, electricity generation consumes some 15% of the global uh, fresh water withdrawals, so significant interaction there. 18% of the global energy is consumed for water extraction, treatment, and distribution. Food production accounts for 70% of the water withdrawals and 30% of the energy consumption. So therefore you see the basis of the, uh, the energy food water nexus. And these interrelationships uh, among the, the nexus um, are uh, really critical to us going forward. So the security of the energy water food nexus is a central challenge to the goal of sustainable development. As far as energy is concerned, any sensible strategy has got to start with demand reduction, whether it's domestic, commercial, or industrial. So that's the place to start. The traditional energy supply chain has everything uh, 
separate. We generate electricity uh, quite inefficiently in standalone power stations. We then put it into a central grid where we have other losses. Uh, we generate the heat domestically by firing fuel in our homes. Uh, and industry over here on the right does use combined heat and power, but if you look at the, um, the way they use energy, around 40% for the large scale energy users gets simply thrown away as waste heat. Rather than use the traditional um, model, we've got to use, uh, I think, move towards a distributed system where we have here um, uh, a distributed arrangement uh, of energy generation linked up to the different sources of energy, waste heat from industry, sending heat off to local commerce and domestic requirements and so on, um, electricity providing transportation energy in the future, power storage and heat storage. So uh, rather than centralise everything, let's distribute everything. Now, next thing is, um, there's no one-size-fits-all solution to this. So for a, uh, a geographical region, uh, there's no single solution to solve this problem. For example, if we take the example of a city centre community, uh, that's going to have different uh, requirements from uh, a rural community. So a city centre, densely populated area, domestic waste as a possible source of energy, uh, a rural community, sparsely populated with agricultural waste as a significant source of energy. The two don't marry together. So, for a geographic region, we should divide the region into characteristic zones, exhaust the potential for demand reduction, and then apply solutions based on distributed energy systems. So, how do we optimise the system integration? Well, um, we've got to look at the basics. Uh, over here, we've got primary energy, uh, solar, wind, hydropower, biomass, and so on. Over here, we've got society and industry needs. We need electricity, heating, cooling, uh, energy for cars, energy for buses, and so on. And uh, what we need to do is to link the two together as efficiently as possible. Uh, different steps we need to go through for that. Primary energy conversion, use energy vectors to move the energy around. Secondary energy conversion before we can link these two together. So, what are the options? Primary energy conversion, we've got wind turbines, hydro turbines, solar, and so on. Uh, the energy vectors, we can use electricity, hydrogen, ammonia, synthesis gas, lots of options here. We can use storage at that point of these uh, energy vectors. We then need a secondary energy conversion, which could be, say, um, hydrogen going into uh, fuel cells, electricity going into electric motors. Uh, we can also store uh, uh, energy at that point as well, um, storing electricity, storing heat. Before we link up, finally, the, uh, whoops, we find, before we link up the um, primary energy with the needs. And of course, all this then has got to be constrained by the energy, water, food nexus. So the problem is there are an enormous number of ways to integrate the systems, but it's also an opportunity for novel solutions to provide novel ways to integrate sim uh, different systems. So let's just finish up quickly with a case study, and this is from the UK. Uh, this is a geographic zone in the UK showing the thermal and electrical demand, and divided into 39 bands across time. Uh, and uh, we look to supply the energy with uh, a distributed energy centre, uh, lots of different options in there, gas engines, gas turbines, fuel cells, and so on. Um, We've got variations uh, of uh, tariffs and uh, we've got grid emissions factors there, different prices going through time. And what we need to do is to model this system uh, and we did it using uh, linear models in this case uh, and uh, model the performance. Uh, the performance uh, varied with load but we linearized that. And <coughs> for the optimization model, uh, we discretized everything through time. Um, we 
chose our different options using integer variables, as, as I explained before. Uh, we did part load, uh, effects, CO2, emissions, and we formulated the whole thing as an MILP, a mixed integer linear program, constraining on the basis of maximum, uh, minimum loads, and maximum CO2 emissions. And depending upon the scenario you choose, you can get different solutions. So here we see um, uh, the uh, heating supplied uh, with a complete import of electricity, no cogeneration, and we get a solution here based on heat pumps, boilers, um, and that's um, the solution where we uh, don't allow power generation. If we then allow power generation and we make this an island solution, so this becomes self-satisfied, then we've got different kinds of machines generating power to satisfy the demand. We've got, um, you see there's a bit of a mismatch here, which is being satisfied by thermal storage. Um, so we're using thermal storage, no power storage in this particular case. Um, and uh, another option is if we allow import-export uh, of, uh, creeping up on me here, um, I know lunch is waiting. Um, and uh, a different solution again, different uh, combinations if we allow import-export. But the result overall was we applied this on behalf of the UK government to see what would happen if you use distributed energy uh, to the CO2 emissions to replace the current system. Well, across the UK, and we did uh, different zones across the UK, it's about 40% reduction in the CO2. But it's basically energy efficiency. It's not a significant introduction of renewables, no waste to energy, no power storage, and various things. OK, finally, conclusions. Uh, many potential sources of energy, east of which have their advantages and disadvantages. Variability of energy demand creates challenges for supply and the security of the energy food water nexus, a central challenge to the goal of sustainable development. Novel solutions can, in principle, be developed through optimization applied to the needs of geographic regions, and novel solutions need to be sought through novel ways to integrate energy systems. Finally, uh, an acknowledgement to the guys who pay the bills. That this, in this case, the case, it was the Research Council of Norway. Thank you, and sorry for overrunning a little bit. Oh. Thank, you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, we just used the time, but I believe uh, you will sacrifice a few minutes from the lunch. Uh, and. Uh, we can maybe have one or two questions or comments. Yes, please. Thank you very much for the nice and interesting presentation. Yesterday we uh, had a, uh, an optimized scenario for uh, uh, using of renewable energies as 100% by, uh, uh, by 2050. And in your uh, concept or in your uh, presentation, you, the uh, you uh, illustrate that maximum is about uh, 70, uh, 90, uh, 69%. Uh, what are the basic for your assumption? And yesterday we, we showed and we uh, saw the the assumption, but in your uh, scenario, please uh, say us what uh, your basic assumption for this uh, uh, somewhat pessimist <laughs> scenario. Thank you very much. Okay. So. Um, it depends whose report you read, whose projections you believe, and that's, that's the basis of that. I think it was the, from memory, it was International Energy Agency uh, report that we, we took it from. But it depends whose report you read, basically, whose projection. It's, all, it's a huge uncertainty. Whoever, whoever you read, there's a huge uncertainty in these numbers. Okay, thank you. It's a uh, few people dying from hunger, but uh, the majority is still okay. <laughs> uh, yes, please. Um, I was wondering, speaking of uncertainty, a lot of, uh, all of the analysis you showed is uh, 
deterministic optimizations, right? Yeah. Using MILP and some yeah. uh, linear yeah. relaxations. Yeah. Have you thought of introducing the vast amount of uncertainty in all of your analysis in some way in order to be able to communicate the results to stakeholders? Fair question. Um, to be honest, it's, it's bad enough trying to include everything in a deterministic uh, algorithm rather than um, putting everything then further into some kind of stochastic optimization, uh, which is what you're, you're asking for. Uh, and of course, as soon as I do that, I'll put some kind of uh, distribution in there into the analysis and everybody will say, where does that come from? Uh, but but uh, nevertheless, I think in principle you're right. Um, you know, there's no certainty in any of this. There's always a, an uncertainty. Um, but for the moment, we are trying to maintain that to be deterministic um, because it's bad enough as it is. Uh, and we still have quite a long way to go before we get all of the deterministic issues in there. Okay, the last one. Yeah. I wanted to uh, know that uh, active redundancy because uh, part load operation because in India the uh, part load operation in thermal power plant is not there so and the, the renewable energies are you know uh, in the future is coming up so how we can use this the part load operations use what sorry I didn't catch the part load operations Active residency. residency. Oh, redundancy. Uh, okay. Um, you can you you can be quite um, deterministic about um, the use of um, passive and active redundancy. Um, there, there's certainly you know um, different ways you can approach this problem. We've very much in our case, uh, taken a kind of worst case scenario. What happens if one of the boilers breaks down? Can you still operate? Um, and uh, uh, that kind of approach. But um, we've also done research which allows you to um, put in reliability uh, for this kind of equipment as well and do much more of a, um, a rigorous reliability analysis. So you can, you can take the uh, active and passive redundancy uh, in different ways. Uh, the way we did it, um, quite crude I think, but nevertheless it's, must, it, it's a must to put in there uh, to be realistic. But then, you know, be, because we are putting this together with a lot of other issues as well, we took a quite simplistic approach to how we account for it. But uh, uh, I understand your point now, and I think uh, this is something that you can go into a lot more depth and detail in. We have done research in that area, but we've not included that kind of reliability theory into this analysis. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Unfortunately, uh, we should uh, feed to the rest. Uh, Robin is still up to Saturday, so you can discuss with him privately. And... Uh, Certificate.